Ooh, things are getting crazy because we are dilating time. When things travel at relativistic speeds, and by that I mean crazy fast, time does crazy stuff. So we're going to talk about a light clock, proper time, improper time, how to dilate it with a formula, and how to solve problems using that formula, and the Lorentz factor. Now with all relativity stuff, we have to explain some very crazy scenarios. So let's say that in a bus, a transparent bus, a uh, red man here is going at a crazy speed of 0.75 times the speed of light, which is fast. And he has in his bus a light clock. And what a light clock is, is an emitter and receiver. It sends a light beam straight up at the speed of light, it hits a mirror, and it goes back at the speed of light, and he's got a crazy precise stopwatch and good reflexes so that he can time how long it takes for that light clock to go. Now watching this whole situation is a man who is stationary on the ground, relative to the ground, and he sees this bus go past and he can see inside and he can see this crazy light clock send a signal up and send a signal back. Now even though red man and blue man watch the same event, they see a couple different things. Red man is at rest relative to the situation. He sees the emitter give off the light and receive it right back at the same place. He has a pretty boring experience. Blue man here sees some crazy stuff happen. He sees, as the train's moving, this light beam move over this way, and then when the, the transparent train car is here, hits the mirror, and then as it continues to move, he sees it hit the receiver over here. And they see two very different things, and they measure two different times. What we're going to say is that red man up here measures the proper time interval. Because from what he watched it, it happened at the same point in space. The emitter and the receiver, it's the same thing. From his point of view, it hasn't moved. This guy down here, blue man, measures a different time. A thing to be uh, careful of. Proper time interval is not what we call the correct time. Either one of these people can be correct, it just depends on their point of view, but we'll talk about why they saw two different things. Now, we know that velocity has to be distance over time, and we want to know the time that red man gets. Let's say that this has a height of h. That light's going to go up, boing, and bounce off. The distance uh, of time, if we can remember that time is equal to distance over velocity, the distance doing, doing, is going to be 2h. The velocity that he has to see it goes that it goes at, because Einstein says so, is c. So his time is going to be 2h over c. Now, this guy down here also knows that time is equal to distance over velocity. But he doesn't see it go h. He sees it go the much longer length l, doing, and then it goes another length l doing in this weird triangle. Now clearly, L is bigger than H. And so if we have 2L divided by C, because he also has to see it travel, traveling at the speed of light, uh, this is for the blue guy, this is for the red guy, this will be bigger. And a good rule of thumb is that proper time interval is always the shortest. If anyone is measuring what is not considered proper, that will be longer. The IB wants you, there's a complex, semi-complex, time dilation formula, and the IB wants you to be able to derive it. I'm not doing it. It's too painful. You can read it in your textbook. I've done it before. I've always gotten stupider whenever I do it. In fact, if I were taking an IB test, and they asked me to derive the time dilation formula, I would, I would just chalk it up as a loss because, man, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a time investment, and I don't recommend it. Well, do it. It might come up, but whew, it's rough. Now, if you want to calculate what the time is that blue man measures, which should be a larger time interval, we're going to say that it is this equation from your data booklet. 
where delta t sub 0 is going to be what we call the proper time. And then that's going to be multiplied by this thing, which is known as the Lorentz factor, named after a famous physicist. And this Lorentz factor is equal to 1 over square root of 1 minus the velocity of whatever, however fast the relativistic thing is moving, divided by speed of light squared. Now, nothing is going to go faster than c, so this part on top here is always going to be slightly less than the denominator. And if you think about it, um, the Lorentz factor is always greater than 1. And the IB also wants you to be able to look at a graph of the speed of some sort of ship, and let's say, and see how big the Lorentz factor becomes as an object approaches the speed of light here. Now, based on this equation, pause it, see if you can sketch in a shape for what this graph will take. Now, hopefully, you notice that as this velocity approaches c, then you eventually get the ratio of c squared over c squared, which would be 1. And that would be 1 minus 1, and that would make your denominator approaching 0. So that means you're going to have some crazy high values as it approaches the speed of light, which no object can do. But when it is very small, you're going to have basically 0. And that's going to be 1 minus 0 will be 1. So most of the time, your values will be down here at 1. And so you'll end up with an asymptote, and then it starts skyrocketing as it approaches C. So the Lorentz factor can become very, very large, infinitely large, actually, as you approach C. IB problems involving time dilation and length contraction are actually not that difficult, as long as you know what is proper time and what is not proper time. Read this problem and pause it and then see if you can solve. Now hopefully you saw that uh, this time here as measured in the rest frame of the particle. That's what we're going to call proper time, which usually gets the designation t sub 0. Uh, you then need to multiply that by the Lorentz factor to find the other time that's asking for. And so our key is Let's find this Lorentz factor first. And so that is going to be the crazy looking formula of 1 minus b squared over c squared. And you just plug in what you know is the velocity of the particle, which is 0.95c. And don't forget to square this. Sometimes people do. And you're going to end up eventually with something, once you do the math, 0.312. Take my word for it. I skipped some steps there. And I'm going to get a Lorentz factor that's equal to 3.2. Does that make sense? The Lorentz factor should always be greater than 1. And my Lorentz factor is 3.2, so that does make sense. So then I take this and I fill it in. The time interval, according to the observer in the laboratory, is 3.2 times that 5 times 10 to the negative 8 seconds. And he ends up with a time of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 7th seconds. And you compare the two times, and you say the observer sees it at a longer time than what the particle itself would have if the particle were measuring its own lifespan. And that does make sense, because this is the non-proper time, which should always be longer.